Amen. And we pray, continue to pray for comfort as the days go on. Thank you that He's in your presence. Father, we, we pray that you would bless this service. We pray that you would speak to our hearts through your goodness. Amen. Draw each of us closer to you as you speak to each and every one of us individually. And we thank you that we can sing songs of praise to you, songs of thanksgiving. And we, we thank you for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, through whom we have tremendous hope. Amen. A sure hope, a sure foundation. Guide us with pray. And again, uh, speak to us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And show the three five, three five mini, from the everlasting arms, or the eighty five, the turn of eighty five, the two eighty five.
that has just been amazing. In my 51 years of being a pastor, this is really the first time I've been on the receiving end with a family member. Understanding even more so how important it is. Church, you are amazing and you are awesome. And I and Jewel and our family is very, very blessed by you. Thank you so very much. I want to read the letter that I received this week to the church. It's from Mark Bailey, Mark Ministries. Pastor Jim, Bible Baptist Church and family. A few years before my mother passed away, she gave me a book by the late great preacher Vance Hapner entitled, The Lord of What's Left. I picked it up not long ago and read it again. I must say it made a greater impact on my life now at the age of 65 than it did when I first read it at 29. When a person is in their 20s, they're not thinking about what's left but what's ahead. Yet I have no doubt that God and my mother's wisdom do that I would appreciate the need and need his words more now that I no more now that I've reached what I call the fourth quarter <laughs> of my life. <laughs> One thought of Dr. Hamner I read this time jumped out at me. God does not always send his prophets through the conventional assembly line that they through the conventional signal line, lest they come out wearing a stamp that does not become them. God made us all different with little fingers, prints, which means I am like no one else, and you are like no one else. Often we look back at our lives thinking we should have done this or that, or why didn't we do this or that, and we become like a dog chasing its tail. <laughs> a lot of action, but going nowhere from too much worry. Don and I go forward at this time in our lives in ministry. We are thankful for the, all the places and people and things we have experienced, both good and bad, because God allowed it all. The bad times brought us growth, while the good times caused us to bloom. I share these thoughts with Brother Jim and Jewel of the Bible Baptist Church family. Because you have been a part of our lives more than any other people or church, You have allowed us to minister in word and song with Darlene when I first began over 45 years ago. You've known our good times, bad times, yet you have prayed, supported, encouraged us all these years, and we are so grateful. We don't know all of God's plans for our future, but we believe we want to finish our days with Mark's ministry presenting the gospel in word and song wherever he leads us. With that in mind, we need a strong pastor and church by our side that knows who we are and understands what we do. We would like to ask the Bible Baptist Church of Erie to become our home and Sydney church to pray for us, advise us, encourage us. In return, we will be your workers to the salvations of the lost and to the encouragement of the saved. Glad to be your servants with love and appreciation. Mark and Darla Amen. Bailey. Amen. 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 Mark is asking to be part of this church family Though they live in Harrison, Arkansas, he's traveling now, and he wants to he wants to do that. That's what he wants to finish out his ministry doing, singing and preaching as God opens the doors, and he's booked up through the end of the year. 
But he wants the Bible Baptist Church of Erie to be his sending church, to be his home church. Amen. And I, I'm making the recommendation to the church that we not only take him as, our, as part of our church family, but we start immediately supporting him $100 a month. That's mission support. Is there a motion to that? Ms. Frieda makes the motion. Is there a second? Ms. Diane seconds that motion. All in favor say amen. 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 No one opposed to the will of God. Mark, of course, is my brother-in-law, Jules' brother. He was 13 years old when we got married. I helped raise him, I think. <laughs> I love him like a brother. He's as close to me as my three blood brothers are. Closer. When I'm around him, I probably laugh more and cry more than any other time. And I do both of those a lot. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm honored that he wants to be part of this church family. So when he is at, speaking at churches, when they ask, what is your home church? The Bible Baptist Church of Theory is my home church. Amen. And, uh, he asked me about this several months ago. I said, I think that would be great. Why don't you write me, write the church a letter? And that letter came this week. And now we've done that. And I, again, you make me proud. You make me grateful. You make me extremely thankful. Let me make just a couple of other quick announcements. They had food bank yesterday. They had 60 boxes, two new families. Now, after church, there's milk. There's bread and rolls. There's baked items. And there's lots of cantaloupe. <laughs> if you like cantaloupe, take some cantaloupe home because it won't keep very long. And uh, we'll do all of that. Don't forget Wednesday night. We've got coming up on October the 24th, the Hissongs. They're a national singing group. They're going to be here on a Sunday evening at 6 p.m. You better get here at 5 and get a good seat. Because you come at 6, you may be standing. Then Mark Bailey will be with us. On Friday night, October the 29th, we're going to have a potluck supper back in the fireside room, and then we're going to have a concert here on Friday evening with Mark Bailey at 6.30. That is going to be a tremendous evening. Ladies, Fellowship of Craft is coming up. There's a sign-up sheet. Up, uh, this, see, I guess that's this Saturday, isn't it? October the 2nd. I keep thinking it's the 1st of September. And again, Ms. Jen Cabot is preparing those boxes for the Christmas Child, Operation Christmas Child, and they're going to do that on October the 16th. Brother Chris and Rosemary uh, Bloomer are our missionaries of the month to Peru, and again, we want to continue to remember them in fervent prayer. Our October missionaries are going to be the McCaskills <coughs> to Scotland, and uh, we'll be talking more about that. All right, I think that's all. Brother Terry, let's have another song. Turn to page 177, please. 177, great. Since I paid
through that beloved song that we love so much, How Great Thou Art.
take your Bibles and turn with me this morning to the book of First John, chapter one. The book of First John, chapter one. I'm doing a series. And it'll take us several months or longer. I don't know. <laughs> But we're doing a series through the book of 1 John. We're going to go verse by verse, chapter by chapter. I want to speak this morning from chapter 1 on God's formula for fellowship. God's formula for fellowship. We're going to stand and read responsibly the first 10 verses or the entire 10 verses of chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. Let's stand together. I'll begin with verse 1 and we'll read down through verse 10. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled, of the word of life. The life of life. And we have seen and bear witness and declare to you the eternal life, which was the Father, and manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also might have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things are we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare to you, that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have darkness with Him, and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not pretend the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. God bless and honor His word. Father, we're thankful again that we can come into Your presence. We just sang one of the greatest hymns ever written. How Amen. Thou art. Amen. Lord, I don't know how to put it in any other words. That the God that we come before today is that awesome God. He's that powerful God. He's that personal God. And He's invited us into His presence that we might have fellowship with Him. And I pray that you would again let the heaven come down and glory fill our soul as we speak and look and teach and preach about the sweet fellowship that we have with our Heavenly Father. In Christ we pray, amen and amen. God bless you. You may be seen. God's formula for fellowship. I want to read a story first that was told by Chuck Swindoll in his book, Growing Strong in the Seasons of Life. And this story was told by Don Graham. And I want to read this story. In the fall of the year, Linda, a young woman, was traveling alone up the rutted and rugged highway from Alberta, Canada to the Yukon. Linda didn't know you don't travel to Whitehorse alone in a rundown Honda, so she set off where only four wheel drivers normally ventured. The first evening she found a room in the mountains near a summit and asked for a 5 a.m. wake-up call so she could get an early start. She couldn't understand why the clerk looked surprised at the request. But as she walked to early morning fog sur surrounding the mountaintop, she understood. Not wanting to look foolish, she got up and went to breakfast. Two truckers invited Linda to join them and since the place was so small, she felt obligated. Where are you headed? One of the truckers asked. White horse, was her reply. 
In that little civic hub? No way! The pass is dangerous in weather like this. Well, I'm determined to try, was Linda's gutsy reply. Then I guess we'll just have to give you a hug. You mean hug me? No! Not like that, the trucker chuckled. We'll put one truck in front of you and one truck in the rear. In that way, we'll get you through the mountains. All that foggy morning, Linda followed the two red dots in front of her and had the reassurance of a big escort behind as she made her way safely through the mountains to Whitehorse, Utah. Now that story told by Chuck Swindoll, that story reminds me of what the church is supposed to be like. Caught in the fog of our dangerous passage through this life, we need to be hugged. Amen? Amen. We need to be hugged. I believe we need the physical hugs, and this is a hugging church, and I make no apologies for that. I believe in hugging because that's what we need. But we need, to, like the truckers did, to have between us those who need <coughs> hugged. They need the, the, the tail lights to, to follow. And with fellow Christians, you know that we, they can, that, that we can follow them and lead us safely ahead with others, that we pass through this world safely. Now John, in the passage of 1 John chapter 1, invites us to be hugged. Now look at verse 3 again. John says, that which we have seen, so John is giving first-hand information, <coughs> that which I have seen with my eyes, he said, and we have heard, so this is not some supposed truth. This is actual, <laughs> factual information that John has given. I've seen it with my eyes. I've heard it with my ears, he said in verse 3. And we declare to you that you also <laughs> may have fellowship with us. John is saying, listen, we live in a cruel, dark world. We live in a... A world that, again, doesn't care about people. They only care about themselves. And therefore, as a church, as a people of God, we need to make sure that we hug one another. That we're there to support and be with and for one another. And so he says in verse 3, that you also may have fellowship with us. And then he tells us, he says, and truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. John is inviting us that we might have a vertical fellowship with our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ our Lord. Vertically, that fellowship. And then he says, you also need not only that vertical fellowship, but you need that horizontal fellowship with one another. He's saying we need to be hugged. We need to be hugged by our Heavenly Father, by our Lord Jesus, and we need to be hugged by fellowship with one another. John is inviting us to come into that apostolic fellowship which is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And such fellowship with God is at the heart of what it means to be a Christian. Listen, Christianity at its core is not the observance of ritual and rules. That's what most people think Christianity is. I've got to do these rituals. I've got to go through this and do that. Or I've got to follow these rules. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. I'm not going to knock it over. <laughs> Don't worry. 
But we think the average person thinks Christianity is about rituals and rules. You go to church and they go through their rituals, blah, 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 blah. They've got their program out there, and you know, you've got to do this and do that. They tell you when to stand, when to see, when to see, when not to, and all the rest of it. But Christianity is not about rules, it's not about rituals. Real Christianity is a walk with Christ. And it, it's a personal walk of fellowship with the living God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's about a relationship. Amen. And that's what a fellowship is about. It's about a relationship. In the passage that we just read here in 1 John chapter 1, you see the word fellowship is mentioned four times in this passage. But this is not something new to Christianity. When Peter had preached on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came down with great power, we read in the second chapter of Acts, chapter 2, and verse 41, well, verse 40. And when many other words did he testify to George, saying, Save yourself from this upward generation. Now, verse 41. Paul or Peter has preached a powerful message. The Holy Spirit has come down. And verse 41 says, Then they, they, that's the people who were listening, then they, it says, that gladly received his word were baptized in obedience. And, and the same day there were added of about 3,000 souls. So the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people got saved. And the biggest part of them, I think, fought the word believers' baptism, just like we did a couple of weeks ago. We're going to do here in another week or two with Brother Jerry. But then verse 42, Acts chapter 2, verse 42 says this. Listen carefully. And they continue. They is these believers, the church now. It says, and they continued steadfastly. Not just once in a while. But this is something they did steadfastly, continually. It was important. And it says in verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And the apostles' doctrine is simply the teaching of the Word of God. The word doctrine means teaching. And they were teaching the Bible. If you don't want to hear the Bible, don't come here. Amen. Because I don't do news reviews and book reviews. Amen. And the latest television programs. Amen. We were going to preach the Bible. And it said they continued in the apostles' doctrine. That's Bible doctrine, Bible teaching. And then it says in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. They continued the teaching of the Word of God. But again, what was so important that kept them together as a family, as one, was fellowship. They continued steadfastly in the Apostle Doctrine Fellowship and breaking bread. That would be, again, times of refreshment. And I think it probably would allude us also to the Lord's Supper. And sin and in prayer. They did four things steadfastly. The apostle doctrine, fellowship, great bread, and prayer. Those were the four things the early New Testament church absolutely focused upon. That word fellowship is the same in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It's the same word we find in verse 3 of our scripture passage in verse John. Now let me talk a little bit about God's formula for fellowship. First of all, we see the principle of fellowship. When you talk about fellowship today, when you say, well, we're talking about fellowship, normally people talk about this friendly social gathering. That's how they relate to fellowship. Many churches have what they call the fellowship hall. We call ours the fireside room. Because it's a multi-purpose type thing. 
But we relate fellowship to some social gathering. We're going to get together at Perkins and have some coffee and fellowship. <coughs> but when John wrote this letter, as I've said, he was up at his age, he was, he was probably 80 years old or older, last of the apostle. He was serving churches in the area of Ephesus. And so he's writing this letter to the church in general at large. And he talks about this principle of fellowship that you might have fellowship, he said in verse 3. Now that word fellowship literally means partnership. When you have fellowship with someone, there is a partnership. When two or more people are sharing something in common, that's why the partnership, the sharing in common of the church is so tremendously important. And notice what he said in verse 3 of 1 John. He said, and truly our fellowship, our partnership is what? Is with the Father and with, with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. You see, He's, he's, he's telling us that, that again, that because of the new birth, because we've been born again, that we have God within us. The Holy Spirit lives within us. And therefore, we are partakers of God's divine nature. Christ in you. The Lord of glory. Christ is in you. Christ is in me. If I'm a child of God, if I've been born again. Now, Paul himself spoke of this partnership so eloquently in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10 when he said, that I might know Him. Paul said, you know, my, my heart, my, my my deep, deepest want, my priority is that I might know Him. Philippians 3.10 That I might know Him, he said. And the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His suffering. Paul said, I, I want to know Him. I want to know the power of the resurrection that brought him from the dead, but I want to know also the fellowship of his suffering. That fellowship again, that partnership of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. That's what Paul wanted to do. That was the principle of fellowship. But notice the participation in fellowship. The participation in fellowship. We see the principle, now not the participation. Again, verse 3. He says, truly, our fellowship, our partnership, our partnership, as he talks about the participation, our partnership, our fellowship, is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, John is speaking about the deity of Jesus because false teachers had gotten into the church called the Gnostics that were teaching that Jesus really wasn't God in the, in the flesh. And John is, is writing to correct that false teaching that Jesus truly was the virgin born Son of God who was God incarnate. That Jesus was the God-man, that He was God, and yet He was man. And John is trying to correct that. He wants the people under, at large to understand that we are participants. We have fellowship. We participate with God the Father and His Son. With John began and John wrote five books of the New Testament. But in the Gospel of John, 
He talked about Christ was seen in the bosom of the Father. Again, the term used to express eternal relationship. And then in John chapter 13, verse 23, at the Last Supper, John himself leans upon the bosom of Jesus. Again, that close-knit fellowship, that close-knit partnership. And so John wants you and I to be participants in it. And then we see the pretense of fellowship. There's a pretense to it. Go drop down to verse 6. Well, let's begin in verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard and declare to you. What's the message? Well, here's the message. God is light. And in Him is no darkness at all. Okay. That's the message. But look at verse 6. We see the pretense of fellowship. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Here's a pretense. The NIV version reads like this, verse 6. If we claim to have fellowship with Him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live the truth. John uses this word darkness twice. He uses it here in verse 6 of 1 John, and he used it in the Gospel of John, chapter 3 and verse 19. He uses this word darkness. Now, metaphorically, the word is used of moral and spiritual darkness, the darkness of sin. In John 3.19, he said, Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. So John is talking about this pretense of fellowship. <clears throat> He'd already said in verse 5 of 1 John here that God is light. Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, You are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men they might see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Yeah. Light is an emblem of the holiness of God. God is always referred to as light. Satan is always referred to as darkness. Satan's kingdom is a kingdom of darkness. Morally and spiritually. Light and darkness have nothing in common. Yep. If you have light, you do not have darkness. If there's darkness, there's no light. There's nothing in common with these two things. And so... <coughs> John is talking about those who pretend to have fellowship. Now notice verse 6 also says, if we say, and he uses that phrase three times. He uses it here in verse 6. He uses it again in verse 8. And he uses it the third time in verse 10. If we say. John is saying, you can talk about having that partnership with God, that fellowship with God. But if you're walking in darkness, you're lying. Because light and darkness are incompatible. They, don't, they, they, they cannot be one and the same. And so... John is saying, if you have fellowship, partnership, communion with God, but you walk in darkness, your walk refutes what you're saying. If you say, verse 6. Socrates and 
Aristotle were known as walking teachers. Aristotle and, and, and Socrates would, would, would take their students and walk around Athens and, and teach them. Walking teachers they were referred to. We are walking teachers. It's not what I say is so important, it's what I do. Amen. How do I walk? <clears throat> Does my testimony to say that I'm walking in the light that God is like, does that testimony line up with my walk? If my walk is totally contradictory, then the Bible says I'm a liar. The pretense of fellowship. We're instructed to walk honestly, to walk by faith, to walk in the Spirit, to walk in love, to walk circumspectly. The walk of a man or woman distinguishes their character, which differentiates them between the children of the devil and the children of light. Now notice, lastly, the practice of fellowship. Look down at verse 7. But, but, if we walk in the light. Now he's already told what the light is. Verse 5, God is light. If I'm walking in the light, God is light. How do I walk in the light? Well, this book gives me the light to walk in. Amen. That's how I know if I'm walking in the light or not. If I'm following God's instruction book. It's the compass that takes me from point A to point B in the right direction. Amen. So he, he's saying now in verse 7, but if we walk in the light, God's the light, verse 5. As we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship. We have this partnership. We have this that's shared in common. He said we have this fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, cleanses us from all sin. In verse 7, he uses the pronoun we. But if we, who is we? That's you. That's me. That's the children of God. We is those who have seen the light who want to walk in the light, who follow the light. We. And so he says, if we, which again is referring to believers, children of God who put their faith in Jesus Christ, but if we walk in the light, as He is the light, that's why people of light have a partnership together. And that partnership is Jesus Christ. Blessed be the time that binds our hearts in Christian life. We have fellowship. We share the same thing. Amen. We have, again, that partnership together. And he says, in that partnership, he says in verse 7, look at it. We have fellowship with one another. And we ought to start shouting glory hallelujah. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. We live in a dark world. <laughs> Amen. It's getting darker by the day. Amen. We still must say this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. We live in a dark world. And I'm telling you, in living in this dark world, we're going to get contaminated by the toxins of sin that is around us. Just by the fact that we're walking through a dark, dingy, dirty world. We're set abounds. And he's saying, as children of light, we're going to be from time to time contaminated by that sin. Well, what do we do? We have a partnership with, the, with God the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. We have that fellowship. 
What are we to do? Well, he says here in the last part of verse 7, in this practice of fellowship, he says, we have fellowship with one another. We have this partnership together. And then he said, and the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, cleanses from all sin. Yes, we get contaminated. But as Peter said, the precious blood of Christ, that precious blood cleanses us in order that we might continue to walk in the light as He is the light, that we might continue to have that fellowship, that partnership, not only with God the Father through Jesus Christ, but we might have that partnership together as His children, as His believers. Church, God put us here to walk in the light, to be the light, and to share that fellowship, that partnership together. Mark Bailey said, I will not share in the part of the Bible Baptist Church of here. That's the kind of partnership I want. A partnership that's going to be there for me. It's a safety net. As someone who cares, who's going to be there. And that's why we're here. We are here for one another. <coughs> that's what we are to do. I love the story that's told in our daily bread. <coughs> the story is told in our daily bread that in the 18th century, an abbot, that's a Catholic whatever, <laughs> the abbot was disciplining two monks for some infraction of rules. He imposed on them the rule of silence. They could not talk to each other. So these two monks in this monastery tried to figure out a way to fill the long hours of silence. Finally, one of them gathered 28 flat stones from the courtyard. Putting different numbers on them, he devised a new game. By using gestures, the men agreed on certain rules for this new game. But the most difficult part was keeping silent when one of them scored a victory. <laughs> <laughs> then they remembered that they were permitted to say aloud the prayer in Latin, Dixus Dominus Domino Mio. <laughs> By using the one word of this Latin <coughs> expression meaning Lord, the winner was able to signal his triumph by yelling, Domino! <laughs> <laughs> And the monks gave the impression they were praying. <laughs> when really they were playing. And thus, the game of dominoes. <laughs> it's easy to put our religious veneer by claiming we have fellowship with God. I mean, we can come in on Sunday morning and put on that religious face and give that veneer. Oh, I'm walking in the light and she is the light. We can put on that veneer. And yet, we can still be walking in darkness and deceiving ourselves. John is saying, brothers and sisters, don't be playing spiritual dominoes. He wants us to experience genuine fellowship and He gives us the formula here. And we experience genuine fellowship by walking in the light because God is light. And we have fellowship, that partnership with one another through Jesus Christ. Do you have that partnership? Do you have that fellowship? Are you looking for a place, a home, where you can experience that fellowship, life, oneness, and partnership together. If you are, I invite you this morning by faith to take that step and say, I want to be part of the fellowship of 
the great respect of believers at Bible Baptist Church. Father, thank you for bringing us together again. I ask this morning again, thank you so much for the sweet fellowship that's in this place. I've experienced it so greatly in these last few weeks, but I have for over 44 years. But it's become so real to me of late. Father, I pray this morning that, again, fellowship is not just a word of our vocabulary, of our religious vocabulary, but fellowship would be something that's real and genuine. That we have fellowship, partnership, of the same thing with our Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the sweet, sweet fellowship that's in this place of worship. Lord, we've come to worship you. We've come to honor you. We've come to glorify your name. We've come to seek your face today. I pray again for the Spirit to move that heaven may come down and glory might fill our soul. Jesus name I pray your name. And amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing a verse of invitation. <coughs> Softly and tenderly, Jesus is God. Carbon dioxide, those old diesel subs. <laughs> Brother Jim wants to say a word. I just like to say that we're all Americans here, Amen. Amen. and we we don't like some of the things we see in these cities. But somehow we need to seek God out and ask Him to stop this. Maniac. Amen. 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 And so, if you join me in doing that, that'd be something Amen. for us all. Amen. 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 thank you for your goodness. We thank you for salvation. Amen. And we thank you, Lord, that each one of these people care about America. Amen. Amen. And our, our, our heritage. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 The food bank's open. There's milk, cantaloupe. Go help yourself.